Okay, oh, hey, this is Gamer actually, and welcome to Gaming Memories. Sorry, you caught in a very bad timing. I'm just busy watching TV all day, watching just some bunch of infomercials and stuff. But anyways, it's actually kind of similar to a character who also does this, but unlike me, he gets trapped in a TV by some sort of robotic lizard. And speaking of which, today's game on Gaming Memories, we're tackling a game that was supposed to be the mascot for the 3DL called Gex. How did this exist? Well, let me give you a brief backstory. The concept for Gex all started with a creator named Lyle Hall, who began the project shortly after joining the new form Crystal Dynamics in 1993. Lyle wanted to take the advantage of both the graphics prowess and the city audio capabilities of the 3DO console. Meanwhile, Crystal Dynamics wanted a main mascot for the 3DO and could rival both Mario and Sonic. Originally, it was going to be about a Hollywood stunt performer named Gecko Axe who needed to help save his contracted film studio from going bankrupt at the Volition antagonist Carl Chameleon. But it was scrapped because Travers said it would lead a lack of sensibility design and structures. So it was changed. The name Gecko Axe was renamed to Gex, and Carl Chameleon never saw the light of day and was replaced by Rez. And instead of a Hollywood stunt double who's trying to save the studio from bankruptcy, it was about a couch potato comedic lizard who is trapped in TV land by Rez. And last but not least, Gex was voiced by the one and only Dana Good which he was a popular stand-up comedian back in the 90s and has been featured on HBO, Showtime, and Comedy Central. Also notable as a writer from The Simpsons and Family Guy. He also wrote all of the dialogues for the character and made movie references, but more on that later. Several developments went through changes, but I won't talk about it because it's kinda complicated. And it even involves someone getting fired because of an easter egg that happened. If you want to know about it, Oddheader made a video about the development about Gex and one of his 8 easter eggs that got people fired. The link is down in the description below. When the game finally came out in April 1st, 1995, aka April Fool's Day, it was a solid hit. Glide highly praises Gex's visuals and wrote down it would win a beauty pageant. And EGM said it was the best 3DO game of 1995 and gave the game their Game of the Month award. So does this game stand up to the greats from Mario, Sonic, and the upcoming Crash Bandicoot? Or does it hold back to worst from Awesome Possum, Wild Woody, and... Bubsy. Well, let's find out, and it's tail time. Normally I usually talk about the story, but it's kind of complicated and Gex's story is kind of actually depressing most of the time. 
but it goes nowhere because I don't think this series doesn't follow continuity and stuff. But anyways, just for a short premise, Gex lives by himself watching TV and eating snacks in his mansion in Mali, Hawaii, which he acquired after inheriting a large sum of money from his uncle that passed away. His dad also passed away due to a NASA rocket accident. Anyways, one day while looking for a good show to watch, he consumes a passing housefly. This insect turns out to be a small undercover drone being controlled by Rez, the overworld of the media dimension. Rez uses the droid to bug Gex and pulls him into the media dimension through the TV set, intending to use him as the network's new mascot character. In order to escape, Gex needs to traverse the media dimension and find remote controls which he could use to destroy the TV sets, blocking his exit back to the outside world. Now, let's talk about the graphics and presentation. The graphics are great. The character Gex is kinda pre-rendered, but I don't see the difference. But good. The backgrounds are stunning and has a bit of a real slash cartoon vibe and the hub world are great. Sure, it may be inspired from Super Mario World's hub, but each world has a different setting. From the cemetery, to the Toon world, to the jungle, to ancient China, all the way to Rezopolis. Overall, the graphics gets an A. Good job, developers. Now, the presentation. The loading screen has a bit of a Semi cutscene of him uh, doing something when you start the level. Like. Or. 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 Or... Especially this one. And do you know what's the weirdest part about it? You can actually skip the loading screen. Yeah, I never seen that happen before. Even though you could skip the loading screen, the game still needs to load the level. So all you're getting is just a black screen in a couple of seconds. Why did Crystal Dynamics did this? Curiosity, I guess? Oh well, who cares. Next is the checkpoints. And that is a camera. Yup, the cameras are the checkpoints. But it's not that simple. All you have to do is tail whip it and wait for two seconds for the camera and there you go. This gets kind of annoying for a while, even though there's not that many out there. Next is he speaks a lot during the game. Feed me! Read a book! These cartoons are so hot! That for 12 years a full house! Kill your TV, man! I'm not in Kansas anymore. This place is weirder than 4th of July at Rick James' place. One for me and one for me. Reminds me of Ed tapping his birthday keg. What kind of creature is that spot? Obi Wan has taught you well. So, this is New Jersey. Everybody will come to party. Okay, there is no substitute. It's good for the first few times. Because it actually gets a little annoying sometimes, like repeated dialogue. And most of these jokes are outdated. Adrian! This one's for Johnny! Roma! Jeez, Let's get back to the mystery van! That's as much fun as being Mike Tyson's cellmate on Valentine's Day. I know they try to make him look hip and has a serious attitude because 90s and stuff. 
but it really comes off as repetitive. Like it's trying to be just another Sonic ripoff clone. Just like all the other ones. So yeah, let's just say it was good back then, but has not aged well now and then. Except there's one line that became Gex's catchphrase. It's tail time! May I say more? And last but not least, the power-ups. Which are bugs. Get it? Because he's a lizard and lizards eat bugs? There are 10 power-up bug-like things on a ball. I'm going to name all of them. Amber balls, which fill one empty hit paw. Ladybug, which fills all the hit paws. Flea, which added one hit paw. Butterfly, which gains an extra life. Red Firefly is to hurl fireballs. Blue Firefly is to hurl ice balls. Yellow Firefly is to hurl bolts of electricity. Personal favorite of mine. Grasshopper is to move faster and jump higher. Centipede kicks him into overdrive to immediate effect. And Caterpillar which gives you invincibility and you won't die at all. Except for poison waters and some sort of a blurry TV kind of sound. Yeah, I don't know how that works. But it only lasts for a limited of time. Next, we go to music. The Gex series doesn't have a memorable or kick-ass music, especially the third one. But the first one is decent enough. And to tell you the truth, it's not that bad of a soundtrack. Take a listen. Overall good, but not the best out of the series. The second one is the best soundtrack out of them all. Now let's finally move on to the gameplay. The controls are kinda loose. Like for example, if you jump on a tiny platform while letting go the run button, your character still moves by an inch and falls. And another problem is which control buttons to press. But that's the only two problems I have with the controls. The rest are fine and decent. I could show you how the buttons work, but I'm only going to show you how to climb through walls. Just hit one of the D-pad buttons to stick. That's it. Nothing else to add on. Now. Usually I show you all of the levels, but I'm only going to mention a few. In the first cemetery level, there are question marks. To activate it, tail whip the question mark, and it shows you the controls of how to move your character, if you're a newcomer to the series. Luckily, it doesn't interrupt you while playing the game, like in most other games that do. It was a good decision by the developers to not shove it in your face, instead if you want to know how to play the game by tail whipping the question marks. Anyways, as for the rest of the level, it's a good level, and trying to get used to the controls. So overall, not a bad start. In the second tune level, it gets a little bit tricky, like trying to avoid this goblin or troll-like wheel thing. 
and it feels like a maze at the same time. Except going forwards. And trying to find a remote is as hard as trying to find a missing gem in the Spyro games. But however, the third tune level is got to be one of the worst level ever. Okay, not the worst as the lava levels from Pitfall 3D, but it's still bad. You start the level simple as pie, but then it turns easy to hard really fast once you go to the second part of the level. Like in this section, to move the rocket up or down, you have to walk to the front to go down or the rear to go up. So what's the main problem? Well, try to go back in the middle position is AWFUL! Once you're trying to go to the middle part of the rocket, it just pushes you out of the rocket falling to your death. You have no idea how many times I falled off the rocket. It took me many, 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 many times to get this part right. So, you may be thinking that part is over, right? <laughs> Think again! After that, we go on to another rocket section, but this time, the rocket goes way faster this time, and you have to make a perfect jump. And there's no checkpoints once you get into this part. So if you die, you have to go all the way back at the second part of the level. I mean, come on! Luckily, this is the only level to feature rockets in the game. So that's one good thing I'm happy about. In the second jungle level, it's an auto side-scrolling level. This kind of reminds me of Super Mario 3 and World auto-scrolling levels. But this one is not that bad. Sure, you'll have a hard time at first, but once you play this level over and over again, it's a kick and walk. And kind of challenging, which is well balanced. In each level, there are actually portals that leads you to the bonus round. But they're really hard to find. The only bonus portal I ever found was in the last Rezopolis level, where you need to hit as much barrels as you can. This is difficult. But at least they do give you something if you didn't hit all the barrels. And the first ancient China level, your surroundings are sumo, firecrackers, and thunder gods. For me, I like this level. It has a good challenge, and the background and scenery looks amazingly gorgeous. Now, we go on to the bosses. So, click this link. You all know the drill. The first boss is a vomit girl who starts like a young, typical beautifulness. But hit her a couple of times, then she turns her into what it looks like to be a hideous girl who vomits, which might be a reference to the exorcist. Now, the only strategy to avoid death is not to go near these sides. Otherwise, one hit death and it's back to the beginning again. The second boss is Fat Superman. Wow, he really must be that desperate of how Men of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Justice League went through. So that's the reason why he turned villain now. Anyways, he charges you by farts. But you have to be fast because he has no time for this. After he's done farting, then he flies in the air, and this is your perfect chance to hit him by dropping these anvils in a corrected position which is hard because you have to time it carefully the third boss you have to climb and jump all the way to the top wall the worm or snake or dragon like thing tries to persuade you by jumping out through holes this has got to be the most difficult boss i have ever played and it's not even a boss battle, it's just you climbing all the way up. But once you achieve it, man, you are satisfied. What kind of creature is that boss? I'm gonna be 
set. The fourth boss is a mech turtle who shrinks down to size and you have to beat him so he could grow back to his normal size. It's all about dodging and attacks. And also, this is the only boss level to have the ladybug power up because they know it's difficult if you're a newcomer. Once all the levels and bosses are completed and you have the last remote, it's off to face Rez. His strategy is tough. Like, he has so many scenarios that I can't name all of them. So instead, here are some of his attacks. Myron. You call it a float, I call it a fresh. When is Grace Jones gonna retire? To beat him, grab a bug that's inside of the lamp or something, I can't tell what the name is, and at the right position, hurl the fly at Rez. Do it as many times, and Rez has finally been defeated, and he escapes which is a sphere of energy. After that, Gex gets sucked out of the media dimension, and now, let's finally wrap this up with a conclusion. Hey, cool. I wonder what's on HBO. So, what do I think about this game? Well, it's actually good and pretty well done to be exact. I know there are some few flaws, like the gameplay is hard, but I like a good hard challenge. And mostly a bit minor, there's not enough levels for each world, like World 1 and World 2 have 4 levels. But however, World 3 only has 2 levels, and World 4 has 3 levels. I know they were rushing for development, but come on, at least put some more levels onto it. And the final world only has 2 levels, I mean, seriously? Seriously? But it's just a minor of mine. But however, the character Gex He's kind of a 90s character and I don't think it wouldn't work now these days. Although he did got two more sequels after that, but more on that next time. Anyways, I give Gex for the 3DO a 4 out of 6. If you're a newcomer and if you want to play this game, Activate the 99 cheat code. Trust me, it's that hard. And last but at not least, I'm actually going to tell you what happened after Gex for the 3DO got released. Despite being a huge hit, it was short lived due to the 3DO being discontinued in 1996. And the 3DO was bombing so hard and struggling to stay in business. And the game that was originally supposed to be an exclusive to the 3DO became a multi console release. And that includes PlayStation and Sega Saturn, both released on December 18, 1995. Then a year later for Microsoft Windows on November 7, 1996. 
They all play the same, but they add in a new world called Planet X. Originally supposed to be the 6 or bonus world to the 3DO, but they didn't have enough time due to the game's release crunch time. And here's another strange part. The 3DO had a save feature, but both PlayStation and Saturn did not have a save feature. They used passwords instead. Yeah. I have no clue why Sony and Sega did this. Or Crystal Dynamics. I think the reason why they removed it because there wasn't enough storage for the compact disc. Or maybe they were just too lazy to put the feature on. I don't know, that's all I can think of at the top of my head. Anyways, this is GamerX20 and I'm going to go back watching commercials. See ya. Modern commercial sucks. Why can't you be more like the 90s? Yeah.